Open your Bibles. It doesn't matter where. It's all good. If you've got a King James Bible, if you've got any other kind, keep it shut and we'll read you the truth. Numbers chapter number 32. Numbers chapter 32. How long am I going to have to wait before you find Numbers 32? I would suggest if you haven't found it by now, you just look intelligently at whatever page you happen to be on there. No one will know the difference, and the rest of us will. I'll read you aloud as you follow silently. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. When they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, and behold, the place was a place for cattle. I want you to notice these folks were wealthy. You didn't measure wealth in those days by money in the bank. You measured wealth in those days largely by cattle, sheep. It says here, verse 2, The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eleazar the priest and unto the princes of the congregation, saying, Arab, this other fellow, Butch, they called him for short, and, uh, yeah, this is the Hiles, this is the HIV. <laughs> and uh, I, better take a, I better take a shot at pronouncing that. Uh, Adaroth, Adaroth, and uh, Dibon, and Jazer, and Nimra, and Heshbon. Why couldn't people in the Bible have names like John, and Bill, and Pete? Heshbon, and uh, Eli, Eli, and Shebem. I should have practiced this before I got here. And Nebo and beyond, even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation. Now I found out these aren't names of people, they're names of places. You know, one of these days I'm going to study before I preach. same sermon to preach everywhere. I just picked out this scripture. I wish I had picked out another one. <laughs> we'll try verse 4. There are no names in that one. Even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle. Wherefore said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for possession, and bring us not over Jordan. And Moses said to the children of Gad and the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall ye sit here? Down to verse number 23, please. Verse number 23. But if ye will not do so, that means if you will not go to war with your brethren, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. Our Heavenly Father, I don't know how many thousands of sermons I preach from this piece of wood here. I know I preach from the same piece of wood just overhauled and remodeled for 33 years nearly. And I pray you to help tonight. I want to be a blessing for many reasons. First, I want to encourage the heart of Brother Randy. God bless him. Thank you for the vision you've given him for America. Bless his heart and his life and his ministry. And then, of course, I want my own people to be blessed. And then I want these, our beloved friends, who come to share tonight with us to be blessed. In fact, I want my life to be changed. And I pray you'd speak through me. Holy Spirit, here I am. Uh, let me be a conduit for you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. We only have one battle today. Just one. It's over that book right there. That's the only battle we have. Every other battle we have goes right back to the book right there. For illustration, our charismatic friends talk about a word of knowledge. Now what they're doing is they're competing with the book. I mean, here is the word of knowledge right here. 
Mm-hmm. I see we only have one. The battle between between independent fundamental Baptists and the charismatic crowd is the book. Yeah. Is the book. Right. We have a word of knowledge. They have a word of knowledge. I personally like ours better. Yeah. You see, the big battle today is over the Bible, the Word of God. For example, where are the words of God? Where are they? My Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Father. That means we have to have every word or we can't live. My Bible said if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will and it shall be given you. That means we have to have every word or we can't get our prayers answered. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. Now you change one, that may be the one that has to abide. Consequently, the battle is over the Word of God or over the Bible. The, where are the words of God? Somebody said they're in the original. Well, we have no original, so we have no, we have no words of God. There's got to be somewhere in the world a book that contains the words of God. God would not say preach the Word and not give it to us. And so the battle's over the Bible being the Word of God. All of our battles today are over the book, the Bible. For illustration. Capital punishment's a big, uh, a big issue in our nation. Well, the whole deal is whether well, you read the Bible or not. It goes back to the Bible. Genesis 9, 6 says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. That takes care of that right now. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the battle is the, is the, the Bible. And uh, uh, all of our problems in America, the, the real battle goes back to the Bible. The illustration, abortion. I mean, what, what does the Bible say? That goes back to the Bible. The battle's against the Bible. I was reading the other day in Jeremiah chapter 1, you know, Bible reading. And I got to the Scripture, said, Before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. Sound like me. You must have been a human being then. God said, Before I formed you, I knew you. I knew you in the womb, he said. And before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. God said to Jeremiah, you were ordained to preach before you ever got born. Don't kill that fellow. He's a preacher. And if Jeremiah's mother had aborted him, not only would she have been a murderer, a murderess, and the doctor who did it would have been a murderer, but all the things that Jeremiah did would not have been done. I find myself wondering what could have been done in this nation had all the people who had been murdered been allowed, been allowed to live. I wonder how many Lester Roloffs have been murdered already in the womb of their mothers. I wonder how many John Rices have been murdered already in the womb of their mothers. Luke 2.41, John the Baptist leaped in her womb. Luke 2.44, he leaped in her womb for joy. It says in verse 44, why he leaped in her womb? He's happy. Why? why how, how could he be happy and not be a human being? He's just as much a human being in the womb of his mother as you are tonight. You see, the battle is against the Bible. That's what the whole thing is. It's against the Bible. The, battle, the, the, the uh, now movement is about the Bible. The DRA movement is about the Bible. The, the woman's equality husses, they're, they're about the Bible. The whole thing's about the Bible. Our battle is about the Word of God. And that's why we're making a heap of uh, issue about this book right here. I mean, I think uh, somebody asked me uh, when the 1991, 1990 came, what do you think this, uh, this decade will be? And I said, if I have anything to do with it, it's going to be the de- decade of the book and the local church. I mean, brother, you, you'd have a hard time finding anybody among our crowd 10 years ago or 15 years ago that came out and said the King James Bible is preserved. Now then, it's the fastest movement in the whole country. In the whole country. I mean, because there's no answer. I mean, either uh, somewhere there's got to be the words of God. So uh, I'd, I'd rather a fellow say it's the RSV than say the, 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 uh, the original. At least he says that here they are. The battle is the Word of God. Luke one fifteen says that John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. The big battle today is over the Bible. The illustration, the queer rights campaign. Romans one twenty six says, For this cause God gave them up. I wonder why God would give up a civilization. I wonder why God would finally pour His wrath down upon a civilization. Here we have the answer. For even their women did change the natural use into that which was against nature. And likewise the men, leaving the natural use of the women, 
burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly. And the Bible said, for this cause God gave them up. The big battle today is over the Bible. The Pope speaks ex cathedra and hands down a bull. That's the only thing I agree with the Catholics about. When the Pope spoke, speaks ex cathedra, he hands down a bunch of bull. Now the question is, is what the Pope speaks, is that infallible or is this book infallible? I like what Pat the Irishman said when he got saved. He got saved, and, and, and he went to a Baptist church. They gave him a Bible. He started reading his Bible. One day the father, so-called father, came down and saw him reading his Bible. said, Pat, you can't do that. So I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to read that Bible for you. And Pat said, oh, no, no, father. said, I found a verse in here that says, Desire the sincere milk of the Word. And the father said, You're exactly right, but I'm the milkman, and I bring the milk to you. And Pat said, That milk you've been giving me is so diluted, I got my own cow. You see, the battle's over the Bible. And brother, it's going to be a bloody battle. And those of us that believe the King James Bible are not backing down. We're not doing it. And, and, and if those Southern Baptists meet down in Indianapolis tonight, it, they, they call them the fundamental crowd and, and the moderate crowd. If the crowd that's fundamental wants to really be fundamental, get right on the Bible. I mean, have an NIV burning session down there in Indianapolis tonight and get right on the Bible. There's no revival without the Bible. And there's no Bible without the real words of God. The battle's about the Bible. Illustration. First Corinthians eleven fourteen says, If men have long hair, it's a shame to him. That settles it. That settles it. You say, What's long hair? It's opposite of short. If you can figure out what short is, you can figure out what long is. Long hair is what some of you guys have on tonight. Now the question is not whether long hair is right. Uh, the question is, is the Bible right or not? The Bible said, uh, even nature does tell us that it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Now, the Bible says it, all right? The question is not whether you believe in long hair or short hair. The question is, do you believe the Bible or not? The battle is the Bible. Illustration. You knew I'd get to this one. Deuteronomy 22.5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man. Now, there it is in the Bible. You say, well, the house will not agree with you. No, it's the Bible. The Bible says it. The Bible says it. Well, you say, well, the house, what does it mean? Well, let's see, what does a man wear? A man wears pants. That's a good place to start. Well, a man wears an undershirt. How about that? That's a good place to start. A woman shouldn't wear shoes like a man. A woman shouldn't wear hair like a man. A woman shouldn't wear a blouse, a shirt like a man. A woman shouldn't wear pants like a man. She shouldn't wear anything that pertains to a man. You say, preacher, I don't believe that. Well, that's the Bible you don't believe. The battle is the Bible. Illustration. Mr. MacArthur's lifestyle evangelism. It's not an issue of MacArthur and us don't agree. It's a matter of the Bible. The Bible says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. And though I'm with you all the way, even to the end of the age of the world, the Bible says go soul winning. The Bible says house to house. The Bible says publicly from house to house. So the issue is not between MacArthur and us. It's between MacArthur and the Bible. Times have not changed been that well long, God had plainly instructed His people to possess the land. The Israelites, after 40 years of wandering aimlessly in the wilderness, now come to the land of promise. They didn't make the same mistake they made the first time. They didn't appoint a committee this time. First time they appointed a committee. A committee is a group of the unprepared or unqualified to do the unnecessary who read the minutes and waste the hours. Somebody said that a camel is a horse assembled by a Baptist committee. But they didn't appoint a committee this time. Last time they appointed a committee. The committee came back and voted like all committees do not to go forward. And they languished for 40 years in the wilderness because they appointed a committee. But now they're, they're going back to the promised land. It's time to enter. Listen to the story. Before they went to the promised land, representatives of the tribe of Gad 
and representatives of the tribe of Reuben came to Moses and said to Moses, we'd like to ask you to do a favor for us. You see, we're other wealthy people. Our wealth is tied up in cattle. Our net worth basically is cattle and sheep. Now, what we'd like to do is this. We've noticed on the east side of the Jordan River, and by the way, they came in from that side. They came from Egypt over here and went around and came back in this way. Now, the first time, they came straight to Israel and came to Kadesh Barnea. But it's always a harder trip the second time when you do the will of God than the first time. If you refused it the first time, it's always harder. So in coming, instead of coming straight from Egypt to Kadesh Barnea, as did the first time, the second time, they go around by Edom and around by Moab and around by Ammon and come in this way. And uh, these uh, representatives of the cri tribes of Gad and Reuben come to Moses and say, Look, we have cattle. We'd like to ask you to do something for us. We'd like for you to let us live over here on the east side of the Jordan. This is a fertile land over here, a good place for our cattle and our sheep to graze. And we'd like to, if you'd let us, to have, keep our wives and our children, our cattle and our sheep on the east side of the Jordan. And the other nine, other ten tribes go across the Jordan River. Now, wait a minute. God had told them in Leviticus 20 and 14 to go in and possess the land. God had told them in Numbers 14, 24 to go in and possess the land. And 43 times God said to Israel, go in and possess the land. Now, what do you mean? He meant the land is yours. You've got to fight for it. Folks, there are a heap of stuff that are ours as fundamentalists. We've got to fight for them. I mean, I mean, I mean the, the victory is ours on a matter of the blood. We've got to fight for it. The victory is ours on a matter of this book. And I promise you this, brother. If, if God let me live until to, to, to 2,000, if God let a few of us live to 2,000, I promise you, you can have a hard time finding the fundamental Baptist doesn't believe the King James Bible by 2,000. Why? Because the victory is ours. But we have to fight for it. Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease? All of us fought to win the prize and sail to bloody seas. No, I must fight if I would gain. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain supported by thy word. But let's go down to the chorus when it says, And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. Yeah, we shall wear a crown. Yes, we shall wear a crown. When the battle's over, we'll wear a crown in the new Jerusalem. I'm saying... God said the victory is yours, but you've got to go possess the land. You've got to fight for what I gave you. Moses looked and said, let me get this straight. You people from Gad and Reuben are asking me if you can stay over here on the east side of the Jordan while the other ten tribes cross the swirling waters of the Jordan River and fight the battle and fight the Perizzites and fight the Hivites and fight the Hittites, and fight the, uh, the uh, uh, Philistines, and drive out the inhabitants of Canaan? You're saying, while wow, the other ten tribes go over there, you're asking if you can sit here on this side and enjoy the love of your wives and the joy of your children and the comfort of your peace and enjoy your cattle and your sheep? Not on your cotton-picking life, said Moses. He said this, and I love this statement. He said, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall ye sit here? Shall your brethren fight the battle against the enemy, and ye sit here and enjoy the love of your wives? Shall your brethren go and fight the battle against the Hittites and Hivites and Jebusites and Canaanites, while you sit here and enjoy the, the pleasures of your children and the wealth of your cattle and sheep? God, Moses said, not on your life. He said, shall your brethren go to war? And he said, here. Now, I want you to draw a circle around yourself. I'm not preaching to a crowd tonight. I'm preaching to you individually. I'm talking to you personally. I'm not talking to your pastor trying to stir him up. I'm not talking to your members trying to stir them up. I'm talking to you individually. I want you to draw a little, build a little booth around yourself tonight. Let me come in. And let me talk to you individually and personally just for a while. Shall your brethren go to war, and shall ye sit here? Now, the battle was over the Bible. God had said in Leviticus 24, go possess the land. God had said in Numbers 14, 24, go possess the land. God had said 43 times to go possess the land. 
Now, they don't need to come to Moses and ask him what to do. Brother, if it's in the book, you don't need to pray about it. And, and by the way, we'd be a lot better off in following a book and talking about, I feel led, I feel led, I feel led. I feel led is the Baptist terminology for a word of knowledge. Our students, I feel led to marry her. Why don't you just go ahead and say, i got a word of knowledge. And by the way, it's, it's as near the word of God and near God's leadership as, your, as the word of knowledge is. I mean, all the Oral Roberts are not in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I wish they were. But I'm saying, God had told them, He said, I want you to go possess the land. Now, wait a minute. So far, we're doing, we're doing well. <coughs> Boy, we agree. The, 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 the battle with the queers is the Word of God. The battle with the abortion crowd, the baby killers, is the Word of God. We all agree with that. But what right do you have to be exempt from the commands of God in the book? Shall your brethren go to war and ye sit here? Shall your brethren go soul winning and ye sit here? Now you listen to me. Let me make it very plain. I'm not, our folks here tonight, it's our Wednesday night crowd, and... Uh, but, but I'll make it very plain. If you're not a soul winner, you're not right with God. You say, I don't like that kind of preaching. Good, I'll say it again. If you're not a soul winner, you're not right with God. You say, that upsets me. I'll upset you again. If you're not a soul winner, you're not right with God. But I'm a deep Bible student. I don't like what you said. Then I'll say it again. If you're not a soul winner, you're not right with God. Shall, shall 4,000 people in First Baptist Church go soul winning and you sit still? Let me see your exemption card. Let me see your exemption pass. You have no right. I mean, you have no right not to go soul winning when your brethren are going soul winning. We got some Reubenites and Gadites all of this room tonight. Shall your brethren go to war and shall ye sit here? Shall your brethren go soul winning and ye sit here? Let me tell you something. If every member of our independent, fundamental Baptist churches, and by the way, there's no such thing as a fundamental church without the word Baptist following it. If every member would obey the command of God to go soul winning, we'd take this whole Chicago area. But you say, preacher, I'm timid, then suck your thumb while you go soul winning. But I'm shy, then blush while you go soul winning. But I'm a deacon. Don't confess it to me. Confess it right here at the altar. Now you listen to me. I said this last night in Greensboro, North Carolina. There is not any one single thing in our Baptist churches as big a joke as the average Baptist board of deacons is. But it's the same old story. One of our graduates down in South in North Carolina met talk of me Tuesday at noon. Deacons has seven deacons. Three of them caused him trouble. Got up in the service and, and said, we're going to fire the fella, trying to get rid of him. They haven't got, they haven't got enough, uh, uh, they, they don't deserve to shine his shoes, much less be a deacon in a Baptist church. Now you listen to me. You listen to me. Shall your other members go to war and you deacons sit still? Every man that's a deacon in First Baptist Church of Hammond and we have anywhere from 80 to 100 on our board all the time. Every single man has to be a soul winner. I said that in, in Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I was preaching a citywide Bible conference at the Masonic Mosque. Can you believe that one? <laughs> Masonic Mosque. After I said a few words about deacons, like I just said, I, uh, well, a deacon came waddling, waddling up to me and he said, he said, uh, Reverend Hiles, he said, uh, I didn't like what you said about deacons tonight. I said, thank you. <laughs> he said, I've got one thing to say to you. I dead sure wouldn't be a deacon in your church. And I said, I've got one thing to say to you. You just don't know how right that statement really was. <laughs> you have no right not to go so winning when others do it. You have the right to sit on your blessed assurance while others go to war and win folks to Jesus Christ. 
It's easy for a pastor who's got soul winners in his church not to go soul winning himself. As I know Harry Field last Monday, walking down the concourse to my gate, and a fella was going toward me. All of a sudden, he act like he forgot something. And he turned around and walked the other way, and he said, Jesus Christ. I said, you know him too. He said, who? I said, boy, you're a better Christian than I am. You just said this, called his name out loud. I want to apologize. I walked with him down to his gate. He'd forgotten a suitcase or something. And I said, you know him too. He said, how do you get to know him? I said, I'm glad you asked me. I'll tell you. And the fellow got saved right there in the hallway of O'Hare Field. I'm saying, let's talk about Jesus. The King of kings is he. The Lord of lords supreme through all eternity. Great I am the way, the truth, the life, the door. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. So your brethren go so winning, and you sit here. Shall, shall your brethren go to war, and you sit here? Shall your brethren go so winning, and you sit here? Shall your brethren go to church every Sunday morning, and you sit here? Shall your brethren go to church every Sunday night, and you sit here? Shall your brethren go to church every Wednesday night, and you sit here? Shall your brethren go to church every Wednesday night? And you're home watching Michael Jordan play basketball? Every member of First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana, that's home watching the Bulls play basketball right now, is not right with God Almighty. I'm talking to people tonight here in this room who are not soul winners. I'm talking to folks in this room who only go to church for it's convenient. Shall your brethren go to war? And you sit here. Shall your brethren go soul winning? And you sit here. Shall your brethren go to church on Sunday morning? And you sit here. Shall your brethren go to church on Sunday night? And you sit here. And you say your brethren go to church on Wednesday night? And you sit here. I'm talking about wintertime. Wednesday night. I'm talking about summertime. I'm talking about vacation time. I'm talking about when you have a job somewhere, work, work, work somewhere. I'm talking about every single time the hinges squeak on the doors of your church, you ought to be on the inside of the, of the walls. Shall your brethren go to war? And ye said here. Shall your brethren quit their rock music? And ye said here. You folks, you young folks tonight, got your rock tapes at home. Came from hell by way of the Beatles. Who gave you an excuse? Who gave you an exemption from decent music? Who gave you a right to play the rock music? Shall your brethren go to war and ye play your rock music? Shall your brethren have wives and daughters who dress modestly? And you wear your shorts and your pants? I know what some of you folks in other churches are saying. I knew you were going to bring that up. I knew it. And I didn't want to disappoint you. And that's why I did it. <laughs> They'll make popsicles in hell before I'll quit talking about this. And by the way, preachers, I'm not the one that changed. You're the one that changed. Because 20 years ago, your wife didn't wear pants. And your wife didn't wear shorts. And your wife didn't go mix women. Who gave you an excuse to disobey me? Deuteronomy 22.5? Hey, where is your exemption card? Who told you you didn't have to be like everybody else is? Brother, if it's good for one Christian to go to church on Sunday morning, it's good for every Christian. If it's good for one Christian to tithe, it's good for every Christian. If it's good for one Christian to go on Wednesday night, it's good for every Christian. If it's good for one Christian to be a soul winner, it's good for every Christian. Shall your brethren go to war? And you said here. Shall your brethren go to war? And you said here. Shall your brethren get haircuts? And you sit here. Who gave you an excuse to disobey 1 Corinthians 11, 14? Hey! Who gave you an excuse? By the way, you moms and dads, who gave you an excuse to let your boys have their hair long? You know what I'm sick of? I'm sick of a lot of stuff, but I'm really sick of this. I'm sick of sitting on platforms across America and watching families come in in our fundamental churches. And here comes Daddy with a nice suit and a nice white shirt and a tie. And here comes his son, looks like a mop, upside down. A pair of blue jeans on about to fall off, comes walking down. His hair flowing in the wind. And then here's Mama. She's got a nice, modest dress on. And here's Susie. 
She's got a long blouse. Now you listen to me. You listen to me. You moms and dads are accountable for how Susie dresses. And your moms and dads, you moms and dads are accountable for how Johnny wears his hair. When you say they're just rebellious then, well, show them the door. No haircut, no food. No, no long, no modest link dress, no bed. Shall your brethren go to, hey, who gave you an exemption? Shall your brethren go to war? And ye sit here. Shall your brethren go to war? And ye sit here. Shall your brethren turn off their soap operas while you play yours? Who gave you a right, Matilda? Gertrude, who gave you a right to watch the soap operas? And don't you sit there with your pious platitude look on your face with their pharisaical phylacteries wrapped around your body and look so pious. You know as well as I know that you got that dirty box on too much. You know you ought to turn those soap operas off. And by the way, turn Phil Donahue off. Like I told my folks Sunday night, turn off that gal, black gal that's fat one time and skinny the next. Now you listen to me. It's time God's people got religion. Shall your brethren go to war? And ye sit here. Shall your brethren go to war? Hey, I'm talking to you individually tonight. Who gave you the right to watch Edge of Night, Corner of Darkness, Secret Storm, Tiptoe and Tornado, Silent Hurricane? Who gave you the right? Now you listen to me. It's right for that man right there to be decent. It's right for you to be decent. If it's right for that man right there to turn that box off, it's right you turn your box off. I'm simply saying it's time that all of God's people did what all of God's people are supposed to do. Shall your brethren go to war? And ye sit here. Shall your brethren go to war? And ye sit here. Shall your brethren go to war? And ye sit here. Shall your brethren quit their movies? And you sit before your television set and watch the movies? Shall your brethren quit movies and you go on to your movie, movie houses? Shall your brethren quit movies and you go buy a movie or rent a movie and bring it in your house? Now, tell me where the double standard is in the Bible. Show me where in the Bible is there's a double standard. That man right there is supposed to be decent. You're supposed to be decent. If it's wrong for him to watch a movie, it's wrong for you to watch a movie. When you say, what kind of movies are you talking about? Everything from Walt Disney on down. You ought not to mess with the Hollywood crowd. I'm talking to people all over. You know who you are. Tonight, you ought to have this altar full of people giving up your, your movies. I'm talking about your NBC Monday night movie. I'm talking about your ABC Tuesday night movie. I'm talking about your HBO, and no Christian will have one. I'm talking about your movie channel. I'm talking about your rented movies. I'm talking about your Hollywood movies. I'm talking about your Walt Disney movies. I'm talking about your Mickey Mouse movies. Shall your brethren go to war? And ye sit here? No, sir. Every Christian ought to have the same standards. Shall your brethren go to war? <coughs> and ye sit here? Shall your brethren go to war <coughs> and leave the world while you stay in the world? Shall your brethren live in the book while you neglect the book? You know what? I wish every Christian so-called TV evangelist would go off the air. All of them. All of them. And I wish the people of God would take that same amount of time and get back in that book. Now you listen to me. You are not right with God if you spend less than 30 minutes a day in that book. I would no longer, I would, no, I would, I would not eat a bite of food before I went to bed at night and I've eaten my portion. I would not eat a bite of food if I hadn't read at least one book, in this, one book of this Bible every day of my life. I'm not kidding you. I'm talking about one book. I'm not talking about one chapter. I'm talking about one book. God's people need to be people of the book. I don't mean believe it and defend it. I mean read it. That man right there is no more obligated to read the Bible than you are. 
and that man right there is no more obligated to read this book than you are. Shall others read the Bible? And ye sit here? Shall your brethren go to war? And ye sit here? Shall your brethren quit their movies? And ye sit here? Shall your brethren not smoke? And ye sit here? Shall your brethren not dance? And ye sit here? Shall your brethren tithe? And ye sit here? I said, shall your brethren tithe? And ye sit here? I said, shall your brethren tithe? And ye sit here? Let me say this. If you owe God one dime out of your pocket tonight, you're not right with God. I said you're not right with God. So your brethren go to war. And ye sit here. Shall your brethren fervently pray every day? And ye sit here. I'm talking tonight to the best people in, the, in, in Chicago area. I'm talking tonight to a bunch of people who are idiots, too. You paid money tonight to listen to two men eat you out. You're crazy. I'm talking tonight to the best people in the Chicago area. I'll guarantee you, I'd bet all, I, I almost bet my salvation on it, and I would bet Brother Randy's salvation on it. That not 50 people in this room prayed ten minutes today. I'm not talking about God is great, God is good, let us thank Him for the cheese quarter pounder. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about now I lay me down to sleep. I'm talking about God's people getting before the throne of grace and reaching up and shaking the throne of grace. Brother, I have not walked to this pulpit right here one Sunday morning since 1984 without spending at least 20 hours on my face before God. And brother, when I spend my time in prayer, when I get through, I'm soaking wet. I mean, not a dry thread on my body. Why? I'm trying to get a hold to heaven and shake down the blessings of Almighty God. You have no right not to pray when others pray. Ought to be a revival of prayer in this room tonight. Old-fashioned praying. Shall your brethren go to war? And you sit here. Shall your brethren pray? And you sit here. Shall your brethren be filled with the Holy Spirit? And ye sit here. Oh, you say, Brother Hiles, I pray my preacher will be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about you. Shall these brethren be filled with the Holy Spirit? And you sit here. When my Bible said, Be ye not drunk with wine, but where it is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. My Bible says nothing about the title. My Bible's talking to every single blood bought person. God commands you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Shall your brethren love their enemies? And you said here, shall your brethren forgive? And you said here, shall your brethren do the will of God? And ye said here, it's right for one Christian to go soul winning. It's right for every Christian to go soul winning. It's right for one Christian to go to church. It's right for every Christian to go to church. It's right for one Christian to quit his rock music. It's right for every Christian to quit his rock music. It's right for one, one, one woman to wear modest dresses. It's right for every woman to wear modest dresses. It's right for one man to get haircuts. It's right for every man to get a haircut. It's right for one person to turn off the soap operas. It's right for all people to turn the soap operas off. It's right for one person to quit movies. It's right for all people to quit movies. It's right for one person to live in the book. It's right for all of us to live in the book. It's right for one person to walk with God in prayer on his face, bombarding heaven's throne. It's right for every Christian to do the bombard the throne of grace. It's right for one Christian to be filled with the Holy Ghost. It's right for every Christian to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I long for the day when every member of First Baptist Church of Hammond goes soul winning every week. And I'll not be satisfied till they do. 4,000 people a week go soul winning from this church. But I'll not be satisfied with that. I'll not be satisfied till everybody whose name dots the membership role of First Baptist Church of Hammond is a soul winner. And I'll not be satisfied till every member goes to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And I'll not be satisfied till every member tithes. And I'll not be satisfied till every member lives a separated life, just like he's preached from this pulpit. You have no right to be exempt. What is your 
card that says you're exempt. Say your brethren go to war. And you sit here. Listen carefully. Why did they feel exempt? Because they're rich. You rich people have no excuse to not go so winning. But you say, Brother Hiles, I have many assets I have to watch over, then get rid of a bunch of them and go soul winning. Well, you say, Brother Hiles, I'm the richest man in my church. You're not right with God unless you go soul winning. These people said, we have cattle. Our cattle can't graze on the Judean Rocky, Mount, Rocky Mountains. Our cattle can't, can't graze on the Judean desert. We've got this fertile land. You listen to me. You listen well to me. When I walked in pastor's pastor of First Baptist Church of Hammond 33 years ago, the, the outgoing mayor of this city was on my board. The president of this big bank down here, biggest bank in downtown Hammond then, was on my board. The owner of this former department store over here, big department store, uh, biggest department store in the county then, richest man in the county then, he was a faithful attender here in this church. And I stood behind this pulpit and told him the same thing I'm telling you right now. God has not given you any special privileges because you've got some pictures of George Washington stacked up in a vault somewhere. Years ago, we had a member of the church told me, he said, I pay my way. I pay my way. I don't have to go soul winning. I'm a big giver in this church. I don't have to go soul winning. He said, because of the gold I have. I went out and got me a bucket of asphalt. I walked down to his office and I said, look what I got. He said, what? I said, a whole bucket of concrete. I said, concrete. A whole bucket of concrete. He said, so what? I said, look at all the concrete I've got. I said, man, I'm rich. He said, you crazy? I said, no, I'm rich. I, I don't have to go so winning. I got, I got a bucket of concrete. He said, Reverend, they paved the streets here in our town with that stuff. And I said, they paved the streets in my town with your stuff, too. <laughs> then they wanted to get an excuse because their past exploits. You see, the tribe of Reuben had saved Joseph's life years ago. And because of past exploits, they wanted to be, be, be excused. They said, shall we live over here? Can we live over here? You other ten tribes go fight the battle. And Moses said, no, sir. If we go, you go. So your brethren go to war. <clears throat> and you sit here. And then because of social standing. No, but the house. I am a member of the local ballet club. Uh, well, take care of that at the altar if you'd like to after it's all over. Well, I go to the opera. I'm an opera lover myself, grand old. Now, you listen to me. God knows no double standards. Richest person in this church is supposed to go soul winning as much as the custodians go soul winning. Old Dr. James McGinley, I wish you'd known him. He lived back years ago and he was funny. He went up to a lady's house one time to eat a couple in a beautiful, gorgeous home and she was showing him all the beautiful furnishings. She said, Dr. McGinley, she said, this furniture here goes back to Louis XIV. He said, that ain't nothing. Ours goes back to Sears Roebuck 15. <laughs> now, I'm not against rich people, but I'm saying you have no excuse not to do what the rest of us do. I'm not against society people if you want to be that, but you're supposed to do exactly what everybody else does. Now, what if they don't? What if you don't pray? like the rest of us. What if you do watch your television set more than you read the Bible? What if you do read the newspaper and the magazines more than you read the book? God says what? He said, if 
you do not cross the Jordan and fight the valley with the rest of us, be sure your sin will find you out. And my brother sitting here tonight, tucked away here, if, I, if you had to give ten verses tonight or die, please don't leave. I'm not through preaching yet, and you knew we'd have two sermons here, so don't leave. Not time to go home. If you can't stay here till 9.45 once a year, then fooey on you. Now listen to me. You are going to have your sin found out. What sin is he talking about? You know, we preach a sermon. Be sure your sin will find you out. What sin was this? Drinking? No. But God said, be sure your sin will find you out. What sin was this? Adultery? No. When God said, be sure your sin will find you out, what sin was this? Cursing? No. When God said, be sure your sin will find you out, what sin was this? Homosexuality? No. I mean, no. <laughs> when God said, be sure your sin will find you out, what sin was it? Stealing? No. When God said, be sure your sin will find you out, what sin was it? Narcotics addiction? No. When God said, what, will you be sure your sin will find you out? What sin was it? Gambling? No. Well, pray tell me, what sin was it that God was talking about when He said, you better hear me, you stay in that sin, and it will find you out. The sin was not being in the battle. That was the sin. Not being in the battle. Every time I go to Garland, Texas, I drive by a house where one of my deacons in Texas used to live. One of the best men I had. Never was a visitation night when he was not there. Never was a Sunday morning or Sunday night when he wasn't there. He was an insurance salesman. Wasn't long till he got promoted. <coughs> he became an executive in the insurance company. When he did... He left the battle some. He left the battle. He quit going soul winning every week. He quit coming to church on Wednesday night. He had too many important things to do. There is no more important thing going on in this world than church on Wednesday night. So he quit it. Then he became the president of the insurance company. Tonight... He's a vegetable. His wife called me on the phone and said, Preacher, you would not know Leon. She said he became an alcoholic. She said he is just a vegetable. What did Leon do? What did he do? He got out of the fight. He got out of the Bible. He got off his knees. He quit his soul winning. He felt like because he was the president of the insurance company that he had an exemption. He didn't, and you don't either. And every time I go to Garland, Texas, I drive down Miller Road, down a hill, <coughs> to the bottom of the hill, and going up the hill toward 1st, 5th Street. On the left is a little two, a little two or three bedroom house. This story is not new to many of you. When I was pastoring in Garland many years ago, I used to stand out in the front of the church every Sunday morning, shake hands with everybody that came in. We had no parking lot, but across the street was a shopping center, and everybody parked over there, so everybody <coughs> came across the street and came in the front door of our building. Every Sunday morning, I stood out there and shook hands with everybody that came. One Sunday morning, I looked across the street, and I saw the cutest couple I think I'd ever seen. This man was tall, six foot two-ish, thin, well-built. Clothes looked like he bought them at an expensive store. Looked like he stepped out of a men's fashion magazine. Everything was just right. I hate a man where everything is just right. I wouldn't give you a dime for a preacher that buttons his collar. Not a dime. If, you, if you're a preacher tonight and you got your collar button, tell your brethren, preach with their collars open and you sit here. Oh, 
Don't you talk to me about your tracks, you dirty hypocrite. This guy came up, he was perfectly dressed. Look at Carl Hatch and imagine what the exact opposite be. That's how this guy looked. His wife was about five foot tall, maybe, maybe shorter, as cute as a bug, uh, if there's a cute bug. <laughs> she had a smile on her face, grinning like a possum. Though I've never seen a possum grin. She's grinning like I think a possum would grin if a possum did grin. Yeah. I'll say that again sometime for you. You can catch it. She was dressed immaculately. I thought, good night, we have wealth here. They've come to the wrong church. I walked out and I said, my name is Jack Hiles, and I'm not going to call his name tonight. I'm going to call a fictitious name, but the story is true, every word of it. He said, my name is Bill Tate. And I said, Bill, this is your wife? He said, yes, Mrs. Tate, this is my wife. I said, are you new in town? Yes, he said, we work for the telephone company. I'm a young executive in the telephone company. He said, we've been transferred here. We passed by your church. We thought we'd come to visit. They sat over here on this side next to the wall. We had 2,200-seat auditorium just all on one level there. And they sat next to the wall over here. Oh, I'm sorry, next to the aisle back here, they sat. Invitation time came. He came and got saved, and she came and got saved. Bill Tate and Mrs. Tate became model Christians. I don't think I've ever known anybody that would be as perfect representative of fundamentalism more so than Bill and Mrs. Tate. Every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, every visitation night, they quit everything a fundamentalist is supposed to quit and start everything a fundamentalist is supposed to start. And then several years passed. Bill started going up in the company. And before you knew it, Bill felt like that he was a cut above everybody else. The only person that's not on the level with everybody else is the fellow who thinks he's a cut above and he's a cut below. So I noticed one Wednesday night Bill wasn't there. I said to Jim Lyons, my associate pastor, I said, can you find Bill Tate? He looked over the building. He said, no, I don't think he's here. He's back the next Wednesday night. Then gone one, then back two, then gone one, then back three, then gone two. About like you do it. One Sunday night, I looked out and Bill and his wife said, oh, sit over here. I couldn't see Bill and Mrs. Tate. And I said, Jim, do you see the Tates? He looked over the whole building. He said, Pastor, I don't believe they're here. Oh, they're back the next Sunday night. And the next, then gone one, then back three, then gone one, then back four, then gone two, then back three, then gone one, then back three, then gone two, then back two, then gone one. Hey, that like you do it. Now you listen again. Every time the door squeak, you're supposed to walk through them. Then one Sunday morning, Bill, and by the way, what was he doing? He was going to conventions for the company. You see, the soul winning was good for the common people, but not for the upper crust. Shall the brethren go to war and Bill Tate not go? And one day it happened. Bill Tate walked in my office. He had his Sunday school record book with him. He taught a junior boys class. He had his Sunday school record book. He said, Pastor, I'm resigning my class. I said, Bill, you know better than that. I said, Bill, something's happened to you. You're not like you used to be. I said, Bill, you're not in church all the time. Wednesday nights you're not here all the time. You don't go soul winning much anymore. Bill, something's happened. And Bill says, I'm right with God. Everybody like that thinks they're right with God. And I said, Bill, don't do it. Keep that class. You need that class. He took that walked out the door. Years passed. Twenty-two years, I think it was, passed. Many years. I was sitting in my office over here where I still reside. I was opening my mail. Looked up in the upper left-hand corner and it said, Bill Tate, Garland, Texas. 
Bill Tate. Bill Tate. Bill Tate. Yeah. The good-looking tall guy with a cute little wife. Yeah. Man, Bill Tate. I didn't know he remembered me. I grabbed the letter, opened the letter. In the upper left-hand corner, it said, Huntsville Penitentiary, Huntsville, Texas. Here's what the letter said. I'm telling it almost word for word. Dear Brother Hiles, I don't know whether or not you remember me. My name is Bill Tate. I worked for the telephone company. I lived on Miller Road in Garland years ago. I was saved at Miller Road Church, and you were my pastor. He said, I'm now in the Huntsville Penitentiary serving a life term. I went, I was out one day driving in my little truck. I drove to the shopping center across from the high school football field, and I found my wife in the back seat of the car making love to the football coach. I went back home. I got my gun. I went back to the shopping center. I took my gun, and I murdered that coach. And I killed my wife. I couldn't believe what I read. Could that ideal representative of fundamentalism murder that beautiful woman? P.S. P.S. It all started the day I resigned my Sunday school class. The day he decided to get out of the war. I'm going to tell you one story and I'm going to quit. You better hear this. In First Baptist Church of Hammond, I don't tell this much here because our people know who this is. In First Baptist Church of Hammond, we had a man who taught Sunday school in our junior department, one of the best men I ever met. His wife was a church of Christ. She would not come to our church. He got up every morning and dressed, I think it was three little girls. Every Sunday morning, he dressed up for Sunday school and church and brought them himself. And he took, he took, it's on a Sunday school class. He went soul winning. I think he worked on a bus route. He was one of the, if I listed the ten best Christians in this church, he was one of them. One day he decided that somebody else could do his job better than he could. He quit soul winning. He quit his Sunday school class. And the inevitable happened. He went into sin. Other sin. That sin do that. He came to my office one night. Don't miss it. I said, I'll call him Bob. His name was not Bob. I'll call him Bob. I said, Bob, there's something happened to you. You're letting other folks do all the work. You're not right with God. You ought to get right with God, Bob. He said, Preacher, I can't get right with God. I can't. I said, yes, you can. He said, no, I can't. He said, I'm leaving. I said, Bob, I'm stationing myself at the door of my office, and I'm holding on to either side of that door. And if you get out of this room without getting right with God, you're going to move me out of, the, out of the door. That good, former, godly man came and took my body and picked me up. And while he was holding me in his arms like this, I said, Bob, God just spoke to me. I said, Bob, listen to me. I beg you, Bob, listen to me. I said, I'm sure God just spoke to my heart. Bob, if you walk out that door with not being right with God, I promise you, you'll be dead within 48 hours. He began to tremble. He said, Preacher, you're the greatest man I know. And I don't want to hear you. I said, Bob, get on your knees now. Get right with God. I beg you. Put me down beside the door. And trembling like that, he walked out the door. I said, Bob, you've got 48 hours to live. Almost to the minute, to 47 hours after that moment, my phone rang. It was Bob's wife. Lived over in Calumet City, a few blocks from there. She said, Preacher, Bob went down to the the Gulf of Mexico to have a little vacation. He just drowned in the Gulf of Mexico. 
And then she said, Preacher, he had our 13-year-old daughter with him. And she drowned too. You can go out here to our cemetery, Memory Lane Cemetery, tomorrow if you want to. You go to the pastoral gardens where our people are buried. You go over to the left of the pastoral gardens and walk back over to the corner, about right in the, in the southeast corner. And you'll find the name of a man and his 13-year-old daughter. You're not going to trifle with God. You're not going to stay out of the battle and trifle with God. I said a while ago, I want to talk to you personally. Shall your brethren go to war? And he said here, you have an exemption. Our Heavenly Father,